Hello everyone, my name is Wolfgang, and today we have a very normal laptop review. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Wolfgang, and today we have a very normal laptop review video where we take a look at the Ninkir N16 Pro. This laptop boasts very impressive specs, especially for its price. A 12 core Auto Lake CPU, 16 gigs of RAM, 1 terabyte SSD, a high DPI 165Hz display, and all of that at a very competitive price of 600 euros. Ninkir was kind enough to send us this laptop for review, and that was a mistake. Because little did they know, this isn't a laptop review channel. On this channel, we strive to build the most cursed, janky, and non-production ready home server on the planet, all in the name of power efficiency. And this laptop is a perfect candidate. Now, we're still going to look at this laptop from, well, the laptop standpoint. Screen, build quality, all that jazz. But the real reason why I replied to Ninkir's email is to answer the century-old question that you guys have been writing in my comments ever since my first NAS build. Can a laptop be used as a home server slash NAS? And an even more important question, who's the sponsor of today's video? Huge thanks to Pulseway for sponsoring today's video. Pulseway is a super powerful IT monitoring and management solution that works from any device on any device. It's easy to deploy and use, and yet very flexible, powerful, and versatile. Apart from the usual IT management features like auto remediation, patch management, and reporting, Pulseway also includes ransomware detection, network discovery, and even an IT self service portal, which lets users resolve a lot of common issues themselves and saves both you and your users a lot of time. With a first-party mobile app for iOS and Android, Pulseway lets you monitor your systems from anywhere in the world, and even remote into them if something needs fixing. Because, let's face it, it's 21st century, a phone app should be a first-class citizen, not an afterthought, especially for something as important as your IT infrastructure. More than 13,000 businesses have already revolutionized their IT infrastructure with Pulseway, and you can do it too. Check out the link in the description to get your free trial, and save up to 25% with Pulseway. So thank you Pulseway for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to building our laptop home server. Now the OGs will remember my video from 4 years ago, where I turned a bare laptop motherboard into an improvised home server. I was kind of broke and just made a video about putting a ThinkPad X230 motherboard into a ThinkPad X220 chassis. So the X220 motherboard that the laptop came with was just doing nothing and collecting dust on the shelf, and I wanted to put it to good use. And I think a lot of people are actually in the very same boat. Maybe you have a laptop with a broken screen that is too expensive to repair. Maybe you just bought a new laptop and don't know what to do with the old one. Or maybe you're thinking about building a dedicated home server and want to use something that you already have as a kind of a proof of concept. In any case, whether you can actually use a laptop as a home server really depends on your use case. Obviously, if you plan to do machine learning, distributed builds, or have some other beefy workload in mind, a laptop is probably not the best way to go. At the same time, using a laptop in that capacity does have some benefits. Laptops usually draw less power than desktop computers, and you even get a free UPS battery backup. Now, needless to say, this Ninkir N16 Pro is not an old crusty laptop that you might have in your garage. And just for the record, I don't think that you should actually buy a new laptop to use it as a home server, but that's what we have to work with today. On paper, this machine is an absolute beast. Intel Core i7-1260p, 12 cores and 16 threads, 16 gigs of DDR4 memory, 1 terabyte of storage, and a high refresh rate 16-inch HDR display. In this configuration, the Ninkir N16 Pro costs 600 euros. And if you look at similarly specced laptops from bigger brands like Asus, Acer, and Lenovo, those would set you back at least 1200 euros. So is this deal too good to be true? I mean, at half the price of the competition, those specs can be real, right? Well, I guess we're about to find out. The machine arrived in the most generic looking laptop box imaginable. Apart from the laptop itself, we also get a 90 watt power brick and some keyboard stickers for different languages. Reaching deeper into the box, we also get a laptop bag, a mouse pad, more keyboard stickers, and a mouse. Honestly, Apple could probably learn a thing or two from this unboxing experience. After opening the laptop and peeling off the plastic film,
We are welcomed with a generic AMI BIOS splash screen. I guess Ninkir didn't have time to put their own logo in the BIOS. Regardless, after the splash screen, we get into the good old Windows 11 UBI, or out of the box experience. But we're actually gonna leave that for later. For now, let's reboot the machine and get into the BIOS. Now, as you can see here, we got a super old school gray and blue BIOS, which we love. And one unexpected advantage of the low effort Ninkir has put into customizing this machine's firmware is that we have access to pretty much every single setting under the sun, including things like disabling Intel Management Engine, C state control, and most importantly, hardware virtualization. And this is great news. On many other less off brand laptops, the BIOS is usually very locked down and only lets you change like super basic settings, such as boot order. Which means that if the manufacturer thought that you don't need, let's say, virtualization support, then you're SOL especially if you want to use your laptop as a very janky virtualization host. I still remember having to mod the BIOS in my ThinkPad T440P to get access to extra settings. So the fact that Ninkir just decided to give us access to everything out of the box is great. But let's rewind a bit and talk about the laptop itself. Outside, the Ninkir N16 Pro looks pretty much indistinguishable from any post MacBook Air Ultrabook. The chassis is made of plastic and aluminum and definitely has some flex to it, but not enough to be concerning. Unlike a MacBook though, this laptop is very well equipped when it comes to I.O. On one side, we've got an HDMI port, two USB 3.0 ports and a USB-C port, with all three USB ports running at 10 gigabit per second. Sadly, the USB-C port doesn't support power delivery, so you'll have to use the factory power brick to charge your laptop. And yes, this port is USB only, no Thunderbolt. On the other side, we've got a DC jack, a gigabit Ethernet port, a USB 2 port for some reason, and a 3.5mm headphone jack. Opening the laptop reveals that it unfortunately doesn't pass the MacBook test. That is, opening it is definitely a two-hand operation. <laughs> but that little blunder is easy to excuse once you see the screen. It's a 2560 by 1600 IPS panel with a 165Hz refresh rate, 100% sRGB coverage, and a very thin bezel. The screen is matte, which is great for direct sunlight. For what it's worth, the image on the display looks really good and the viewing angles are also great. If I had to nitpick, the high refresh rate kind of feels unnecessary for this display, since there is no dedicated GPU or even a Thunderbolt port to connect an external graphics card. Still, it looks pretty cool and all the animations in the OS are buttery smooth. Unfortunately, the gap between the screen and the bezel at the bottom is pretty large, and after like 5 minutes of use, some dust already got in between, which is not great. I got tired of fishing it out from under the bezel pretty quickly, so you'll have to deal with it throughout the video. The screen assembly does have some wobble to it, but nothing too terrible. Now let's talk about the keyboard. It feels pretty good to type on and has almost no flex to it. Not a classic ThinkPad keyboard by any means, but definitely usable. There is also a numpad, which is great, and the keyboard is backlit. The backlight is uniform, but unfortunately on the lowest setting, it does this weird thing where it becomes ever so slightly brighter when you press on a key. So when you're actively typing on the keyboard, the backlight will flicker, which is not great. As for the touchpad, the only way I can describe it is… serviceable. It's made out of rough plastic and has a very cheap click mechanism. To add insult to injury, it's possible to trigger both the right and the left click simultaneously by pressing in the middle of the trackpad. On the bright side, there is a fingerprint scanner, which is cool. So overall, I think it's fair to say that in order to get this laptop to 600 euros, Ninkir had to make some serious sacrifices in terms of build quality and the I.O. The laptop is built pretty cheaply and unlike some other models with similar specs, doesn't have a Thunderbolt port. But at half the price of big brand laptops with the same CPU, it would honestly be pretty silly to expect the same quality. Now let's open this bad boy up and see what's inside. The bottom panel is held by 11 screws, all of which are the same size and length, so kudos for that, Ninkir. After taking the panel off, we are welcomed by a single 16 gig RAM stick and a 1TB SATA SSD. In my opinion, two 8 gig sticks in dual channel will definitely be better, but on the other hand, if you want to upgrade this to 32 gig, it's actually a good thing. I already had two matching 16 gig sticks from Crucial, so I'm just going to remove the factory RAM module and replace it with my two sticks. On the storage side of things, we got two NVMe slots, which is great. The SSD that the machine came with is SATA though, not NVMe. And I guess that's one more place where Ninkir is cutting some corners. On the flip side, two NVMe slots means that we can install two NVMe SSDs in RAID 1 for caching, 
or even go absolutely crazy and install things like this SATA controller, but we're going to talk about that later. Finally, there is an integrated Wi-Fi module, which isn't soldered in and can also be upgraded. But enough talking about the hardware, I've got a USB drive prepared with the newest version of Proxmox, so we're going to set it up and see how it works. So the installation went fine, I guess? I struggled a bit with the file system part since I only had one SSD and wasn't sure what RAID mode to put if I want to use ZFS. At the end, RAID 0 worked, so that's what I went with. Fun fact, in order to be able to record the installation process, I actually had to disable the internal display entirely, which is weird. One thing I wanted to mention is that your laptop might not support hardware virtualization, or maybe it could support it in theory, but there's no BIOS option for that. In that case, you can still install something like Open Media Vault, Unraid, or even plain old Debian, and just do everything in one system. But since we've got a laptop with hardware virtualization, I kind of wanted to run a bunch of VMs and just let it rip. So now that the setup is complete, we're going to reboot into our Proxmox installation. As you can see, we got our IP address right here, so I'm gonna go over to my Mac and enter the IP address plus port in the browser. And there you go! That's our Proxmox instance up and running. But before going any further, we need to do some housekeeping tasks. Now I have to say that I'm not a Proxmox expert, so if you want a more detailed guide on how to set it up and configure everything, check out this video from Techno Tim. Personally, I found it very useful. That being said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna switch to my terminal and SSH into the Proxmox machine. First thing we're going to do here is disable the Enterprise and Ceph repos. We're running the community version of Proxmox, I think that's what it's called? And because of that, we don't have access to the Enterprise repos, which weirdly enough means that we can't even update our system. So let's go to etc, apt, sources, list, d, and basically just remove the two files here. Then we're going to install all the available updates by typing apt update double m percent apt upgrade. Finally, I'm going to explicitly enable IOMMU so that we can pass through our USB controller and our graphics card. For that, we need to add a boot option to our kernel. My particular installation uses systemd boot since I chose to go with ZFS as my root file system, which is very confusing because grub is still there and the update grub command actually still does stuff. Well, anyway, let's edit slash etc slash kernel slash cmd line type intel underscore iommu equals on right here, and then let's save the file and type proxmox-boot-tool-refresh. And now we can finally reboot in order to install updates and enable iommu. Before actually booting into Proxmox, I also wanted to get into BIOS and make sure that iommu is actually enabled. The laptop refused to show BIOS on the external display, so I had to film it the old school way. And apparently the whole thing is running in like test mode instead of production, so um, yeah, very cool. I also decided to use the opportunity and disable the Intel management engine, because why not? And now that I've made sure that iommu is actually enabled, let's save our settings and boot into Proxmox. But before doing that, you might have noticed that we don't have any storage, which could be pretty useful for serving media, downloading Linux ISOs, and sharing files over the SMB. That being said, this machine has no SATA ports. I mean, it's a laptop. It does, however, have two M.2 slots, which means that we could theoretically use one port for a boot drive and the other one for this M.2 SATA controller. Now, granted, you would have to get pretty creative with powering the drives. 2.5 inch drives take 5 volts, which you might be able to get from the USB ports, but for the 3.5 inch drives, you will need both 5 and 12 volts. And since laptops usually have 19 volt power supplies and do their own DC to DC conversion, I think that's what it's called, well, unless you're like Louis Rossmann, you're out of luck. But that doesn't mean that I was just going to give up, so I took the laptop apart again and put the SATA controller into the M.2 slot. I took 5 of my drives and connected all of them to the laptop. In order to power them, I took this Pico PCU, jumped it with a piece of wire, and then used two SATA splitters to power my drives. These SATA splitters are not the safe kind, but honestly, does it even matter at this point? Still, this type of SATA adapters is known to the state of California to cause cancer, and I'm only using them for educational purposes. Don't, don't try this at home, okay? So this is what the um, final product looks like. And although it's basically a massive fire hazard, it does work. 
all of my drives spun up and as you can see, all five of them are visible in Proxmox. But let's be honest, if you're trying to use your laptop as an improvised home server, you're probably not gonna do any of that, and nor should you. In most cases, you'll either have an external hard drive or something like this, a USB SATA adapter with an external power supply. So I'm just gonna take this contraption down before it catches fire, and then I'm gonna get back to you with a single 6TB drive. Alright, so we're back in Proxmox, and the first thing we're gonna do is set up our first VM. It's gonna be an Ubuntu Server 2204 VM, and we're gonna use it to run some Docker containers and Samba shares. Technically, you could do it on the Proxmox host itself, but I prefer keeping things separate. First, we're gonna upload the Ubuntu Server ISO, like so, then we're gonna create our VM. I'm gonna call it Ubuntu-Docker. We'll choose our ISO image as the installation medium, and here I'm going to give the VM a bit of disk space, let's say 120. I'm also going to give it 4 CPU cores, and for the type, we'll go with host. This basically quote-unquote passes through your actual CPU to the system, gives it access to all the instructions that the CPU supports, and as a result, gives you the best performance. Finally, I'm gonna give the VM like 8 gigs of RAM, I don't know how much that is in megabytes, as you can see, and then we'll click on finish. But before starting our VM, we need a way for the VM to talk to our USB drive. So I'm gonna go to the hardware tab and pass through the entire USB controller, because why not? And now we're gonna launch the VM. I'm gonna skip the Ubuntu installation part because that's pretty trivial, but after booting into our installation and SSHing into the VM, we can see our hard drive. Nice. Now I'm gonna install Docker, basically following the official guide for Ubuntu and copy pasting some bits. As you can see, Docker works, so now we can write a quick Docker Compose file for Jellyfin and, let's say, Home Assistant. Oh, and by the way, I'm not gonna get super deep into setting everything up, like stuff like Docker, Docker Compose, Samba, and so on, but I am working on that video you all have been asking me about, going through the entire software setup on my home server, so yeah, smash that subscribe button, I guess. As you can see, I've put our hard drive mount point in the volumes, but we actually also need to format and mount the drive. So let's do that real quick. I'm gonna format the drive in XFS, and then I'm gonna create the mount folder and mount the drive. Finally, we can launch our compose stack and see if it works. And it does. Kind of. The reason why I wanted to try Jellyfin in the first place is to test the hardware video transcoding. But for that, we actually need to pass through the integrated GPU inside the VM. Now I've read a lot online about how it's basically impossible on Alder Lake and was actually preparing myself for the worst, but at the end, I just had to add these two parameters in the boot menu, restart, and add the GPU as a PCIe device in the VM settings. After that, I could see the rendered device inside of my VM and added it as a device to the container. No, not that container, dumbass. So now we need to copy our usual hardware transcoding benchmark, aka Dune2021. In order to do that, I'm gonna do a quick and dirty Samba setup. First, let's install the Samba package by typing sudo apt install Samba. And then I'm going to paste the config from my main home server into slash etc slash Samba slash smb.conf and edit a few things here and there. Finally, I'm gonna restart the Samba service. And now we can go over to my Mac and connect to the server. As you can see, it says 5.96 terabytes left, which is exactly what we want to see. After our movie is done copying, we can go over to our Jellyfin instance and do the initial setup. Then, we're gonna activate the hardware transcoding in the settings, like so. And now, we're finally ready to see if this little baby can handle a 4K HDR HEVC movie. And the answer is yes, this thing absolutely rips. I've mostly seen 80 to 82 FPS throughout my testing, with dips of around 52 here and there. For comparison, a Coffee Lake CPU with Intel Graphics UHD 630 gets around 50 to 52 FPS in this movie, so 80 FPS is crazy. Fun fact, as soon as I started to play the movie, the laptop screen started acting very weird, not sure if that's normal. <laughs> And as for Home Assistant, well, to be honest, I kind of changed my mind and decided that Jellyfin should be enough for a test. Running many typical home server containers at once is not really all that impressive, 
My Intel i3-6200 can do that, a Raspberry Pi can do that, and this 12th core Alder Lake chip can definitely do that. So let's switch gears a little bit here and do something that actually does require more horsepower, running more VMs. Running a Windows VM is something that you would probably want to do at some point or another. Maybe you don't have a dedicated Windows machine and want to run some Windows only software. Maybe you have some suspicious file that you want to open and you want to do it in a more or less isolated environment. Or maybe you just want to see the whole world burn. In any case, let's run a simple Windows 11 VM here and see what happens. I struggled a bit with installation because no matter what I chose, Windows couldn't detect the virtual hard drive, but as it turns out, I should have just left it at default, which is IDE. Vert.io performs better, but you do need to install special drivers for it in Windows, and I'm too lazy for that. And as you can see, after installing Windows 11, enabling remote desktop connections, and connecting to it from my Mac, everything runs pretty snappy. Videos are a no-go over RDP, of course, unless you're okay with like 5 FPS, but for everything else, this runs pretty well. And while we're at it, I decided to rate Minesweeper games and all the VMs that I'm going to be installing today. My copy of Windows 11 has no Minesweeper installed, so it gets 0 out of 10. Next up, let's install Windows 7. After obtaining the 64-bit ISO of Windows 7 from some very questionable sources, I just set up a VM, choosing Windows 7 as my operating system, and pretty much sticking with all the recommended defaults. We can also see just how little the Windows installer has changed since 2009. After our installation is complete, we're once again going to enable remote desktop connections and connect to it from my Mac. As you can see, it works, and things are even snappier here. We even have the Minesweeper pre-installed, as well as some other games. The game seems to be broken though, because I keep losing, so I'll give it 3 out of 10. But why stop here if we can install Windows XP? After obtaining a Windows XP SP1 ISO from an even more questionable source, I created a new VM, once again following the Proxmox recommendations, however, I did disable networking, because I didn't know exactly where the ISO came from, I wasn't about to give it full access to my network, and I was too lazy to isolate it into a VLAN or whatever. The installation went pretty smoothly, apart from this weird pop-up. Yeah, I think my decision to turn off networking was justified. In any case, after booting into the installation, things are once again pretty fast and snappy, even when using VNC. This copy also has Minesweeper, but this version of the game also seems to be broken. I guess it's an old Windows bug or something? Anyway, I'll give it 4 out of 10 for nostalgic vibes. So in my search of a Minesweeper game that actually works, I decided to install Haiku OS. And holy crap is this the quickest OS installation I've ever seen. Haiku OS does have Minesweeper available in the Haiku Depot. And after installing it, I unfortunately have to conclude that there seems to be something wrong with this laptop's hardware, because there is no way all the operating systems I've installed have broken copies of Minesweeper, right? I did like the little emoji at the top of the game though, so with that in mind, I'll give this version of Minesweeper 6 out of 10. There's also Super Tux Cards, but playing it through VNC is obviously not a great experience. In all seriousness, the Ninker N16 Pro handled all 5 VMs like a champ, the CPU load stayed at around 10% with all 5 VMs running at the same time, sometimes spiking to around 20-30% to load. However, I can't really say that the laptop didn't break a sweat, because even though the CPU load never got higher than 50%, anytime I would do literally anything on this laptop, the fan would just start screaming. And at first, I thought that the fan curve might be a bit too aggressive, but looking at the CPU temperatures, it looks like the fan noise might be justified. Running something like Windows, or a regular copy of Ubuntu, bare metal, meant that any time you would do as much as open a browser, the fans would just kick in immediately. And in Proxmox, the fans would pretty much start blasting as soon as you would do anything in a VM. Now, I might be just spoiled by my M1 MacBook, but like, this doesn't seem normal to me. And I guess it's one of the places where Ninkir decided to cut corners. But if you don't care about the noise, or can somehow MacGyver a ghetto cooling solution, this machine can definitely handle VMs. Now, power efficiency is one of the reasons why you'd maybe want to unironically use a laptop as a home server. Unlike desktop computers, laptops are built for power efficiency from the ground up, since they actually need to run on batteries. And since power consumption equals heat, Minimizing power draw is especially important for laptops, since they can't accommodate huge cooling solutions. So, how does this laptop do? Well, at idle, with no VMs running and the external hard drive spun down, 
we see the power consumption go as low as 7.2 watts. After starting up the Ubuntu VM, the power consumption pretty much doubles, going up to 14.4 watts. That's with the hard drive still being in the standby mode and the two Docker containers, Jellyfin and Home Assistant, both running in the background. Finally, starting up the rest of our VMs, Windows 11, Windows 7, Windows XP and HiQOS, makes the power consumption go up by just 3.5 watts, putting our total power consumption at the wall at 17.9 watts, which is actually pretty impressive. Of course, you can pretty much forget about the C states when that many VMs are involved, but it is what it is. But the question is, how does it compare to a desktop PC? Well, I have set up a little test bench here, based on an MSI B150i motherboard, 16 gigs of RGB RAM, and an Intel Xeon E2176M. It's a bit less powerful than our i7-1260P, but it should still do just fine for testing purposes. I've also transferred the laptop SSD into the build so that we can test with the exact same software setup. Finally, for power, I'm using a Pico PCU paired with a 12V laptop power supply from Nike. Initially, the desktop build only wanted to go down to C2 in power top and drew around 9 watts at idle. By process of elimination, I managed to find out that it was caused by the cheap M.2 to SATA adapter. So I switched to a USB to M.2 adapter and lo and behold, we got to C8. And in C8, the idle power draw went down to as little as 6.2 watts. With the Ubuntu VM up and running, we're up to just 11.4 watts, which is actually 3 watts lower than the 14.4 watts of the Ninkure laptop. Finally, with all VMs running, our desktop build draws just 15.9 watts, 2 watts lower than the 17.9 watts on the laptop. So honestly, the results are pretty unexpected. I mean, you would think that a laptop would definitely be more power efficient than a desktop. After all, laptops have tightly integrated motherboards, low TDP CPUs, and all of the components are handpicked to optimize for power efficiency. And yet, here we are, having a desktop machine from 2015, drawing less power than a laptop from 2023. And sure, if we run both machines full blast, the i7-1260P will obviously have better performance per watt, and just better performance period. But when it comes to typical home server loads, like serving media or running VMs, the desktop build is able to do it while drawing less power and being a lot less noisy. So I guess that if your main reason for using a laptop as a home server is power efficiency, you'll probably be better off with a small form factor business PC, like Dell Optiplex or HP ProDesk. These come with socketed desktop CPUs and can draw as little as 2 watts from the wall at idle. As an added bonus, they're almost as portable as a laptop and can definitely be used as a compact Proxmox node on the go. So there you have it guys. We've turned a Ninkure N16 laptop into an improvised home server, installed Proxmox on it, ran multiple VMs, and tested stuff like video transcoding and file sharing. We also answered the main question of the video, can you run a laptop as a home server? And yes, you can. There are obviously multiple caveats though, including but not limited to things like bias support for virtualization features, connectivity, storage and I.O. And finally, fan noise. To summarize, yes, you can use a laptop as a home server in a pinch, but it would almost never be the best choice for the job. So thanks to Ninkier for providing the N16 Pro for this video, and I will leave the link in the description if you want to buy one. And as usual, I would like to thank my patrons, James Uppington, Kevin Ware, Alessandro Calori, Carlos Bonilla, David Love, Jubastica, Robust Dream of Crypto, and many, many others. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.